All right. There's a new study which just hit the scientific streets displaying once again why you should probably aim to eat organic. Not to say organic's perfect, because it's not. And there are still a lot of open questions about organic herbicides. But what we do know is that these traditional ones, for example, the most common herbicide used across America today, glyphosate, has let off nothing but bad cellular and metabolic juju since we humans been studying it. And this new research only makes that case stronger. Let's go. Yo, yo, yo. What is up? Welcome back to another week of How to Health. My name is Kevin. I run liftandbalance.com where we take aim at all things health and longevity and do it in an odd, weird, interesting, and highly sarcastic way. Today, we are exploring why not only your food matters for your health and longevity, but why what you put on your food is equally important. In this case, we are referencing the thousands of produce items and the millions of processed items, which have links back to the most common herbicide on the planet. You know, that one which has a growing number of documentaries produced on it each year, yet only seems to be increasing in prevalence through our modern agricultural system, for now, at least. But that's not the focal point today because that deep dive has been done many times before. Instead, we're gonna be honing in on some new research out of Arizona State University, linking this compound to inflammation and dysfunction in the last part of the body we want inflammation and dysfunction. The five pound mushy membrane we call our brain. Not only impacting here and now function, but having potential long-term impacts as well. So before we dive into this new data, it's important to first understand a little background on how this herbicide interacts in the mammal body. And we'll of course close out this powwow with some tactical ways that you can start mitigating your risk. Because come on, in this vast world of unknowns, all we can do is try to sleep well at night knowing we did the best we could with the information and resources we had. Side note, sleep, also detoxifies the brain, so good way to hedge your bets. Just saying. Okay, so if you happen to watch one or all of those aforementioned documentaries highlighting the growing prevalence of these herbicides across many of the foundational crops in our system, this includes but isn't limited to soybeans, corn, wheat, oats, sugar beets, and canola, you'd be told that these key crops make up many of the popular items on the shelves of grocery stores across the country. But not only that, also that they're the staple food for much of the livestock stock across the country, aka our food's food. And just to give you a little taste of the numbers, the U.S. Geological Survey notes approximately 300 million pounds of glyphosate are used annually in the United States alone. And when the U.S. Food and Drug Administration began testing for contamination in 2016, they found that 67% of soybean samples tested positive, 47% of wheat samples had detectable levels, while corn and other grains also showed significant contamination. Now, that being said, the United States EPA currently classifies up to a certain level of contamination as safe, meaning if it stays below these levels, they don't see it as harmful to the human body. However, this classification did not stop the International Agency for Research on Cancer from classifying it as a possible carcinogen for humans, meaning something that is linked to cancer formation. And as we'll see today, this may not be something worth taking too many risks on, mainly due to the way it likely interacts with our cellular and metabolic self. Here's what we know. Previous research, mainly in mouse models, has displayed that once consumed, glyphosate is able to stay chemically stable all the way down the digestive tract to the smelliest place on the planet the large intestines. And it's here when it interacts with the trillions of gut microbes that dictate so much of our health and longevity, the problems begin. As it has been observed that this compound can be metabolized by some of the microbes into a metabolite called aminomethylphosphenic acid, or AMPA 
which we're gonna go with from here on out because I don't think I could successfully pronounce that again. And once this metabolite is produced, it can do what so many other metabolites produced by the gut can do, traverse the gut wall and enter the hottest biological club in town, club circulation. And at this point, you may be thinking, so what? Another metabolite in circulation, big whoop. To which I'll point out what we also know from many other powwows. Not all metabolites are created equal. Just as short chain fatty acids like butyrate produced by our gut microbes have far reaching body and brain effects, the research indicates that also seems to be the case with AMPA. But unfortunately, not too many of these impacts seem to be positive, especially in the brain. As studies in animal models have shown that AMPA can actually traverse the once thought to be impenetrable blood-brain barrier, making its way into contact with the billions of neurons operating within the cranial cabinet. And when it gets there, it doesn't just put its feet up and relax either. Exposure to AMPA in the brain has been shown to trigger higher levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines such as TNF-alpha, which are linked to neuroinflammatory processes. And this is significant because chronic neuroinflammation is one of the foundational components implicated in basically every neurological disorder. And even though the EPA considers certain levels of glyphosate safe for us humans, recent studies, including the one we're about to cover, indicate that AMPA can persist in the body and accumulate in brain tissue over time, raising questions about existing safety thresholds and whether it's safe at all. Oh, so what exactly did this new study find? Let's dive in. Using a series of mouse models, researchers out of ASU confirmed an association between glyphosate exposure and symptoms of neuroinflammation, anxiety-like behaviors, and even premature death. In mice, that is. But uh, yeah, yikes is right. However, the new details they revealed on how this actually takes place maybe even more troubling. As they took a look at the effects through one of the most prevalent and devastating diseases on the planet, the loss of one's literal self, AKA neurodegeneration. Exploring how AMPA affected both a regular group of mice and a group which was predisposed to getting the disease. To do this, they administered both groups either a high or lower dose of the herbicide over a 13 week window, followed by a six month recovery period. Finding that AMPA was detected in the brains of both the normal and Alzheimer's prone mice. And just for some additional rationale around the dosing, they used a high dose to be consistent with levels used in previous research, while the low dose was an attempt to mimic what the current safe levels indicated by the EPA would be in mice. So a little mouse map. There. With that clarity, one of the most surprising findings from the study came when researchers observed that the lower dosage still led to harmful effects in the brains of mice, even after exposure ceased several months. In fact, they found that glyphosate caused a persistent increase in inflammatory markers in the brain and blood even after the recovery period. Researchers called out that this prolonged inflammation could drive the progression of neurodegenerative disease, including Alzheimer's, indicating that even temporary glyphosate exposure can lead to enduring inflammatory processes that affect brain health. And to add a little real life human context, it's estimated that most Americans are exposed to glyphosate daily, making this research team conclude that constant exposure to glyphosate may be a significant health concern for human populations and that there needs to be a continued vigilance and intensified surveillance of its neurological and long-term health effects. Well, certainly makes you think. Unless glyphosate is blocking it already. Bad joke? Okay, moving on. Now, I need to reiterate, like I always do, this and much of the previous data was all derived from mouse models. And if you haven't noticed, mice 
aren't humans. So all of this needs to be taken with the proper grains of non-glyphosate salt. However, in this game of swaying your odds, likelihood, and probabilities in a health-promoting way, it's probably a good idea to deploy that strategy of owning your health and do your best to avoid this questionable chemical. So let's talk about some ways to do just that. And in my eyes, it all starts with knowing what to look for. Because I don't know if you've been in a food store lately, but it seems like every aisle is filled with colorfully marked boxes and bags, doing their best to convince you that not only does the product taste great, but it's also got some healthiest things in it, like more fiber, protein, no sugar, and my personal favorite, now made with real ingredients. Begging the question, what the hell was it made with before? So it's important to be able to see through as much noise as possible and find the right signal. And since glyphosate is the world's most heavily applied herbicide, used all the time on crops like corn, soy, wheat, sugar beet, and cotton, aka, and as mentioned before, those key crops which make up the vast portion of the processed food supply, it's safe to assume that the majority of foods with these ingredients come with some level of contamination. That is, unless they're organic, or a certification which indicates that the ingredients do not contain anything which has been genetically modified or sprayed with synthetic herbicide, pesticide, or insecticide, the most common of which being Glyphosate. This classification is basically the difference between having pasta with or without a sprinkle of herbicides, or for that matter, any fruit, veggie, or processed food. And as good as the labels sound, GMO free, all natural, made with real ingredients, they don't mean diddly squat. Now, if you were listening carefully, and I know you were, you would have noticed that I called out synthetic herbicides, pesticides, and insecticides in my previous statement. And that was for a reason. Because organic foods, at least here in the US, are allowed to be sprayed with organic, naturally occurring herbicides, pesticides, and insecticides. Which, to be honest, the jury is still deliberating on many of them in terms of their potential bodily impact. So although organic is still much better, there are still a number of open questions. That's exactly why I personally like to take a few minutes and look up the company which is producing the organic products that I buy, mainly to see if they outline their farming and processing practices on their website. And what I found over the years of doing this is a very interesting trend. And that is the companies which take pride in their methods and have a good healthy story to tell typically shout it from the rooftops, not only on their website, but if they have them, they're social feeds too. So I encourage you to give it a try and see what you find. Now, one of the common pushbacks on the recommendation of only choosing organic is that shit's expensive, to which there are a few suggestions. First, try and buy in season. As organic fruits and veggies in season tend to be basically the same price as their conventional counterparts. So scout out those sales. Next, of course the pre-made, pre-cut stuff is gonna cost more. So buy the whole ingredients and make it yourself. Cooking is fun and relaxing, I promise. I mean, just look at Cookie Monster. I think the oven might be broke. Moving on. Lastly, know your clean 15 and dirty dozen. These are the 15 fruits and veggies that when bought conventional, AKA non-organic, have shown the least herbicide and pesticide residue, and thus are safer to eat. Compared to the dirty dozen, which are the 12 most chemically sprayed, and thus the ones you always want to try and buy organic. Finally, a closing statement on the food our food eats, specifically poultry, dairy, fish, and meat. Buying organic, grass-fed, pasture-raised, and wild here mean these animal-based products have a substantially lower probability of passing along harmful chemicals to you, the consumer. Because at the end of the day, you're eating what they ate. Just like our gut microbes eat what we eat. And as we know, 
all of the food we consume not only get broken down into the key components needed to build our cells and synthesize the oh-so-critical energy of life, ATP, but it also acts as the building blocks for proteins, peptides, hormones, and neurotransmitters which dictate if those very cells will operate efficiently. Meaning, the old adage was right. We kind of literally are what we eat. So think of each meal as an investment in your most valuable asset. And just like any investment, the sooner you start, the more it compounds and pays off. In this case, with present day health and long-term vitality. So please don't fall for the ultra-processed, toxin-infused rug pull, and instead start eating with intention today. Did we did we check on Cookie Monster? Oh, I've been still. It's a it's a war zone. Okay.